the main event of the evening, a six-man tag with half an hour left in the show. It's a Christmas present. The big entrances, everybody got their, their big entrances, FTR and MJF against Sting, Darby Allen, and Lack Mussolini on LSD, CM Punk. Uh, a couple of observations. Great sign, MJF stole Christmas. But again, as we've established, they bring signs because they remember the Attitude Era and everybody wanted to be part of the show. Uh, FTR's AAA belts look like license plates for a 36 Packard. And I enjoyed, even though obviously we just did a segment here on how I thought face paint was overdone in wrestling 30 years ago, Punk comes out last with the Sting tights and his face painted in solidarity with with uh, Sting and Darby Allen and does the Sting howl instead of its clobbering time. Straight out of the Dusty Rhodes playbook. If he was in a six-man with the Road Warriors, he'd wear the spiked shoulder pads and the face paint. If he was in a six-man with the Rock and Roll Express, he'd wear the bandanas and blah, blah, blah. So that's, you know, and in Greensboro. Because obviously the the people there are going to be even more, what's the word I'm searching for, more more sympathetic and warm towards Sting because he's been, that was his coming out party and he's been there so many times over so many years, blah, blah, blah. And it had to be a thrill for FTR to work with Sting in Greensboro because they're North Carolina boys. But besides that, I, is was this the best six man tag that AEW has yet ever presented? I can't think of another one better. I I, I hear you going through your mental Rolodex now. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure this was really good though. Um, I can't. Every other six man tag that I could think of had the cosplayers and the gymnasts in it. This is the first time they've actually had main event guys in a real wrestling six man tag team match. And there was stories through the whole thing. MJF started out the first thing by ducking Punk. And that's what was going to be the recurring theme as it should have been. It's free television. You're teasing the pay-per-view or you're teasing the big event. You're teasing the match down the road. Punk and Dax started out the match by working, which was incredible. And then Cash and Darby got in and did more. Re there was more wrestling in this match than in any normal AEW match. I was amazed at the start that everybody was pitching in and there wasn't a turd in the punch bowl. They finally, they, they did a, a setup to tag Sting in. He got a big pop. And then Punk chases MJF out of the arena. They come back in from the other end. The people wanted to see Punk get, get his hands on MJF. Um, but at, at that point, that spot was to end up with all the heels on the floor there to set up Darby coming. You can't even call it a dive. He did a flying body block through the ropes on all three heels and bounced off of them. You heard the smack of the meat in the flesh. And it, lo it looked like a pinball going into fucking, you know, the, the heels. Boom. It was great. And that was a break spot. And I'll buy that. That was fucking great. And by the time they'd come back from the break, they had stopped Darby Allen for a set of heat on him. And they were kicking the shit out of him. And MJF would only get in whenever, you know, everybody was in control and he would want to fuck a little bit with punk. But the heels were working like heels here. And they even built body slams. They slammed Darby Allen numerous times, just regular slams. And then. Cash goes to do it, and Darby Small packages him and makes a bit of a false comeback because he got a big pop with just one body slam, and then he tags Sting for the real comeback. So they actually not only got a nice little false comeback, and he gets a pop with a body slam from an AEW crowd, but then hot tags Sting, and Sting makes a real comeback. And then the heels fed for it perfectly. And it was an extended comeback. Then he gets the scorpion and MJF comes and stops him from behind and they go to the break again. It was a fucking brilliant. 
they come back. Now they've got Sting down there getting some heat on him. But then they do the deal, which I, it's a little comedic for me, but it works because it's Sting. And in Greensboro, even though he had to position himself because he didn't really get it the first time, but he did the thing where they have the double knockout and he's woozy and he falls over and headbutts MJF and the nuts. And then kind of gave a tag to Punk. It could have been hotter, but poor Punk leaped up. I think he was going to springboard off the top rope, but his foot slipped. So he recovered and just landed on his feet in the ring and made a double comeback on FTR. So great save. Couple of false finishes. And then FTR stops him on the turnbuckle and they hit their superplex and big splash off the top for a two count which was close. MJF had disappeared by this point. He's hiding. Cash and Darby took a great bump over the top rope. And then they did something off camera that popped the people like crazy and put both of them under the timekeeper's table, but there was absolutely no camera shot of it. Brian, remember when I've said that one of the producer's jobs is you have to go over the match that the besides the fact of giving them the finish and making sure they're not doing anything stupid once they've got their match then you have to hear it because you got to be in the truck to tell the director what's coming up if it's something crazy and the reason why that camera shots are missed on these things is because one of two things either the guys don't bother to tell the producer or the producer forgets and doesn't tell the director and that's why you get no shot of this off-brand shit because nobody expects it to be coming up. So they need to tighten that shit up. But Dax and Punk are in the ring trading. And then FTR hit their finish on Punk, but Sting made the save. And then MJF is back, and he DDT Sting, but Sting no-sells it and nuts MJF on the ropes. And then... I know they're trying to give Sting all these big spots, but Sting ran MJF across the ring and hip-tossed him over the top rope where FTR was waiting to catch him. But you can't... If you're going to hip-toss somebody over the top rope, you have to hip-toss them over the top rope because that turns them. If they dive on their own and they're still trying to be hip-tossed, if you don't put any oomph behind the hip-toss, they're just going over head first, which is what happened. He went head first over MJF or over FTR and almost landed head first on the floor. They broke his fall enough that it didn't break his neck. But do you see what I'm saying? With the turn, Sting should have been underneath MJF's left arm with his right hand and he should have been around MJF's neck with his left hand and he should have got under him good so that when MJF jumped he could have both pushed and turned MJF's head but as it was MJF just dove straight over the top rope and that was a dangerous thing but having said that as soon as they determined that MJF was not paralyzed and might walk again someday Sting comes off the top with a crossbody onto the floor on all three heels, and that got a big pop because fuck, he's 62 and it's Greensboro. Um, and then that was all we got because Punk was lining up MJF for the GTS, but Dax came in and shoved MJF to the floor, and then all three baby faces gave Dax <laughs> their finishes and beat him one, two, three. Um, a, a, a great match. And to get FTR lose again. This time it was the, the right finish and the perfect result. It's just all those times that they beat FTR with lesser talent in places they shouldn't have been beat that has now made it, instead of this being a big impactful thing, is like, okay, well, we know FTR loses again. Which is... <laughs> which is why you should give guys credibility before you start having them do jobs to everybody in sight so that when they do start doing some, it means something. Nobody believes FTR is going to win anything these days because they never do simply because the Hardly Boys are jealous of them and have to prove by a self-fulfilling prophecy that they're not the best tag team in wrestling, even though they are. Your thoughts? 
I like MJF and FTR together, although I hate them being called MJFTR. I think that's <laughs> stupid. I hope that doesn't stick. I wasn't crazy about Punk coming out with the face paint, and I get the reference to Dusty doing it when he teamed with the Road Warriors or teamed with Sting. But I don't know. It didn't feel right to me. But, you know, it's a minor thing to kind of pick on here. With the MJF moment where I was scared, I thought he broke his neck there for a second. I looked at it like he was overcompensating for an older wrestler who may or may not be able to do what he was trying to get him to do. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's well, the Well, and don't do it. the spot, because then it's a rib on yourself. Oh, I'll do this big spot with Sting, and he'll still be walking tomorrow, but I'll be paralyzed. It was good to see Punk, uh, not Punk, uh, MJF do a promo afterwards, because it showed that he was alive. So that was good <laughs> to see. But MJF has heat, and he's great. If he does more with FTR away from the Spears and away from the Tullys, Wardlow, if you need to, just because you're building to something eventually. They all wore matching colors. Like, it looked good. It looked right. They aren't that far apart in height. It just looked really good. Every, everybody looked professional. Everybody looked in shape. Everybody could work. Everybody seemed serious. It was a level above the, you know, the rest of the flock there in that company. You had three of the best in-ring workers in the whole business on that heel side. And that'll get some people mad because some people say, oh, MJF's not that good or FTR aren't that good. Talk to anyone in the business. In the ring, those guys know what they're doing. And Punk is having just a great 2021. I'm sure he'll have a great 2022. Darby's, yeah. I love Darby's dives. I wait for him now because he lays them yeah. in and now I'm seeing him bounce off people. It's even cooler. <laughs> and I'll give AEW credit, although it's, it hasn't always been perfect. And he's gotten some wins over guys like FTR that show in Queens and different things. It hasn't been perfect. But when you see the way Tony Khan has used Sting for now the last year, and you compare it to all the ways WWE used Sting. Oh, good Lord. Or any other way you could have used Sting right now, and I actually think they've done all right. I will agree with that. I think they could have put a couple of things that he did on pay-per-view instead of free television, because in hindsight, it didn't matter for the ratings that much. But what he has done, for the most part, has been nothing wrong with. And it was a good main event. And, you know, they did a good rating. And I believe the main event ended up pulling similar ratings to the opening of the show, which is a good sign. Usually the viewers are just tuning away, <laughs> not coming back. But it was a good main event. And it went a while, it went like a half hour. And I've said it before the serious stuff on these shows work. And if you have more stuff yeah. with Punk and MJF and their aligned uh, wrestlers and Brian Danielson and Adam Page and what they got going on and different things. This is the shit that works and that's really good and that feels like a modern take on the things that worked in classic wrestling. The Bucks and the Best Friends and Adam Cole and all that other shit. It just feels like... I can understand why some people thought that was cute a few years ago, but it feels like everything else is kind of passing that stuff by right now. Hey, the rest of the kids are growing up and the, the uh, problem class is being left behind. And I and I think we're going to see more behind the scenes drama probably as they figure out that oh shit, this company now has real talent coming in and it's showing us up. How can we stop that? How can we bury these people? We'll find out who who comes in and has the cachet and the pull in the industry not to get buried on purpose, like a lot of the other people have been that didn't have that same pull. Well, you know, perhaps if you were brought in and buried and you didn't have any pull, you needed to find a way to get some pull. You needed to find a way to get a good lawyer. I'll tell you what. You're exactly right. <laughs> 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 and I'll tell you something else. You know, I've talked to our friend who I will mention in a second uh, about some of these things lately. He has filled me in, folks. If you want to find out your legal predicament, whether it's positive, negative, or indifferent, there's only one man that you need to call in this entire world. Call Stephen P. Much 
show or two. Still to the rest. Yes, I was just talking to our good friend, Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Wishing him a Merry Christmas. And we, we were talking about these arbitration clauses that he's been paying close attention to. And he's attempting to call people's attention to them so that they won't fall in these traps. They're all over the place. And I should mention, obviously, the way it came up was, of course, my internet service with Spectrum, as well as my cable service. I can't buy pay-per-views, and I can't get the internet speed that I'm paying for, despite the upgrade that I got. And he checked into, actually as a Christmas present for me, suing these rotten, crooked, criminal bastards, Spectrum. But he said, did you know that when you accept their service in the fine print without even reading anything, you, like a lot of these other contracts that are signed by some of these companies like the WWE or just anybody you have performed services for you or buy utilities from, they have arbitration clauses that say that if you have any problem with them and they don't do what you're supposed to, what they're supposed to do, you can't sue them. You have to go to arbitration. Or if you're employed by a company and something goes wrong there and somebody mistreats you or harasses you or whatever, you've given up your right to a jury trial like uh, uh, the Bill of Rights supposedly gives us. It goes into arbitration and then the company that you are sideways with gets to determine whether you are at fault or whether the person that works for them is at fault. And guess how that usually goes? So you see, it's all part of all these legal clauses and mumbo jumbos that people are using to put you, the innocent American citizen, under their thumb and behind the eight ball. And that's where a talented attorney like Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084, can help you or anyone else that's been the victim of greed or avarice by these companies that sell defective products, defective services. As I mentioned, Spectrum, who, as we've mentioned before, their own employees say is a horrible company, and we had the testimony of the serviceman that canceled his service before he was deployed to the Middle East, and then six months later, when they didn't cancel it, they sent one of our servicemen to collection on an account he didn't use while he was deployed. Boy, it just makes me pissed off to think of all the things that people get away with these days. So if somebody thinks they've gotten away with something on you folks, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Before you do anything, get the advice of an experienced professional. Stephen P. New is the man for you.